the uh, <laughs> something just said to me this meeting is being recorded so we're uh, we are all together um the uh let's see um uh, I was delighted that I was asked to speak with you about the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is something I've been working on for about 30 years. Um, in 1970, I was invited to help start Governor State University down in the far south suburbs. And uh, I was particularly interested as I was teaching sociology and community studies, and I was particularly interested in the historic Black communities south of Chicago. And as I was investigating those communities and getting to know people, I kept running into references to the Underground Railroad. And my reaction was, well, wasn't that on the East Coast? You know, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and all those people in Pennsylvania, New York and Maryland. And that led me on this quest. And I've spent the last 30 years trying to figure out how do we talk in meaningful ways about the Underground Railroad here in Illinois and particularly in Northeastern Illinois and in Chicago. And uh, my initial research really focused on the suburbs south of Chicago, uh, but I've really, I've been working on all the other stuff. I've got two books out. I have a, a book on the, um, the Underground Railroad specifically in Chicago with a regional perspective should be out in a year. And that'll be a, in my third, uh, my third book on this. But I'm uh, out of that, all of that history and all of that digging, uh, I'm delighted to uh, share with you some thoughts. And I'm gonna tell, give you a lot of stuff. I've got a bunch of images. I'm gonna tell you a couple stories and then um, we'll have time for some questions and I'd be delighted to respond to those. And uh, Hillary will be managing, managing the questions. So um, let's get ourselves going. Okay, are you with me? Does this, Hillary, are we, we're showing up okay? Okay, great, terrific. Okay, <clears throat> wanted to uh, talk both about the Underground Railroad and freedom seekers, generally referred to as fugitive slaves. Those of us that are involved with it now are talking about freedom seekers. That is to see them, these folks, in terms of their basic intent. And that is, these are remarkable individuals, families, and small groups that were seizing their freedom, that were enslaved and decided that they had to have a change. And so we're, as we've been talking about them, we think it's much more important to talk about their vision and their actions as freedom seekers than to talk about their status as fugitive slaves. And so you'll hear me using uh, both of those kinds of terms as we talk about this remarkable group of people who in the several decades before the Civil War reached for their freedom to, uh, to become free human beings, to, to move out of their bondage. Now, as we talk about this stuff, we always have to begin with, and we should never forget the condition of slavery, to realize that we're talking about an absolutely incredible institution. People that were enslaved, Africans enslaved by Africans, taken to the coast, sold to Europeans, uh, the horrific Middle Passage. Uh, it's estimated that somewhere around 12 million people were enslaved and brought across the ocean to the Americas. Interestingly, of those 12 million, only about 400,000 actually were brought to what becomes the United States. And the people of African descent in America today are basically the descendants, where about 43 million are basically the descendants of those 400,000 that came to America in the years before the, uh, the American Revolution. And of course, as they came, they were here as property. And it's very difficult for us to get our heads around the reality of people as property. When I do my research, I'm not looking at population census data. I'm going back and I'm looking at property records. And it's there with the horses and the pigs and the cows and the sheep that I find the records of the slaves. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult, but very important that we understand the, uh, the horrific nature of the institution of slavery and what it did to people and uh, the consequences, and it was it was just a incredible uh, stain on uh, on the history that we all carry. 
Now, um, people wanted to get their freedom and they headed in all kinds of directions. And they helped, essentially the freedom seekers are the ones that created the Underground Railroad. We often think of, you know, all these good abolitionists set up the Underground Railroad to help the slaves. Uh -uh. The fugitive slaves, the freedom seekers, as they moved out of their enslavement, they confronted other people who then realized, we've got to respond, we've got to help. And it was the networks of support that arose in response to the movement of freedom seekers that creates the Underground Railroad. And of course, this is a wonderful uh, cartoon from 1844. Of course, the Underground Railroad was not underground and it was not a railroad. It was this network of support that rose up in, uh, in response to the, uh, the movement of freedom seekers. It was also known as the Liberty Line. Uh, there's one kind of interesting story about where the Underground Railroad name comes from. Uh, it seems that a couple uh, freedom seekers had escaped out of Kentucky and were on their way to uh, cross the Ohio River, got into Ohio, and right behind them were slave catchers. This was in the early 1830s. And the slave catchers get across the Ohio River and the fugitives have simply disappeared. And the story goes, the one slave catcher turns to the other and says, well, they plumb disappeared. Maybe they just got some kind of underground road and they just got, got away from us. And that story was carried by abolitionists and it turned into talking about an underground railroad because in the 1820s and 30s, the great technological achievement in America was the coming of the railroads. So why not have a railroad for freedom? Now, freedom seekers went in all kinds of directions. This is a map from the 1850s and I've added the blue lines. The majority of people escaping slavery uh, came north, but there were others that, as indicated on my map, there were others that went uh, to the west. There were others that went into Mexico, others to the Caribbean. Some even commandeered ships uh, along the coast and sailed up the east coast to freedom. But the majority came through, um, uh, um, came into the north. Now note this map from 1850, the, the slave states are in the darkish color, the free states are red. By 1850, California had been admitted as a state. <clears throat> but note, and people often don't recognize this, Missouri was a slave state, as was uh, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. They did not leave the Union. They continued in the Union. And remember, when Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, and <clears throat> that was for enslaved people in the seceding states. Lincoln did not free the slaves in Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, or Delaware. Note also that uh, here, uh, Missouri has hundreds of miles of border with the free state of Illinois and the free state of Iowa. And it should be no surprise that uh, an awful lot of the people that come into Northern Illinois have come out of Missouri. Now, <clears throat> in terms of overall numbers, my research suggests that in the decades before the Civil War, six to 10,000 freedom seekers managed to find their way into the state of Illinois. Uh, a number stayed, uh, a number were captured and returned. Uh, most, almost all headed for Northeastern Illinois, the Chicago Calumet region. And in the, uh, the decades before the Civil War, my best estimate is that 3,000 to 4,500 people escaping slavery came right through our region. And that's a remarkable number of people. <clears throat> and it turns out that that is roughly 10% of the people that escaped uh, from the South. So in fact, Illinois, although it's not in the history books yet, uh, Illinois had a significant proportion coming through the Chicago region of people that were going for their freedom. Once they got to Chicago, roughly a third continued on overland. Another third went by uh, lake steamer uh, around the lakes to Detroit. 
and the other third or so went after the 18 in the 1850s went by train. Uh, remember, Chicago was like the great way station. <clears throat> the real object was to get to Detroit um, because the uh, in Detroit, all you had to do is get across the river and you were at freedom in Canada. Now, what I've discovered in the Chicago region is that there are over 40 places where we have very good documentary evidence that freedom seekers were here, they found assistance, and then they traveled on. So all over the region, very, very few of these places have been fully documented. And um, uh, it's, it's a shame because there just was so much activity across the region. Uh, there were basically two streams of movement. People, for the most part, freedom seekers were coming up the Illinois River Valley. And when they got up into uh, uh, the area kind of southwest of Chicago, a significant number came overland from Ottawa and Peru, followed the, the stage roads to Chicago, or they came along the Illinois and, and Michigan Canal. Uh, and we've got, I've got great stories about people doing the canal. Uh, th roughly half went that way. The other half came straight across uh, Will County and Southern Cook County, and all were heading on to Detroit. Uh, coming out of Chicago, they were on the old Chicago-Detroit Road, and going across, they were on the Great Salt Trail, both of which I'll be talking about uh, in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> After 1850, there were rail lines reaching into Chicago, the Michigan Central and the Michigan Southern went to Chicago. And so the obviously the, the, the folks coming to Chicago prior to the 1850s had to either walk on to Detroit or take a, a wagon or a stage, or they had to go uh, on the lakes. After 1852, it was possible to put them on trains uh, to Chicago. And interestingly, in 1854, there was also a train line from the Ohio River, the New Albany on the Ohio River and Salem Railroad going straight up to Michigan City. And that became another way in which freedom seekers kind of made their way. Remember, the issue was, how do we get to Canada? The great irony that the only way to be a free person was to leave the land of the free. You had to get to Canada to be free. Okay, now let's talk a bit about this northern, this northern route where people came overland through Ottawa, Plainfield and other communities, Naperville uh, to Chicago, or they came along the Illinois Canal. From there, they then came down south out of Chicago, crossed the Little Calumet River and continued on, uh, on what was the old uh, Detroit to Chicago road. In Ottawa, uh, to the, the southwest of Chicago, well, 50, 60 miles. John and Martha Hassock and a number of other white abolitionists in these river towns and what become the towns along the i &M Canal are uh, confronted by the arrival of freedom seekers and realize that they have to respond. And so they do that and they pick up and they uh, are very responsive and, and they really begin to gain a reputation as abolitionists. Uh, in Lockport, this is the old i &M Canal building, which has now been designated as a national site for the Underground Railroad, uh, and uh, symbolizing the fact that a, a large number of folks actually came up either alongside or literally on the i &M Canal in canal boats on their way to freedom, on their way to, uh, on their way to Chicago. Uh, in the western suburbs, there are a couple places that have been, uh, that people could go visit that have been, uh, that are really, really interesting. I particularly suggest the Sheldon Peck house. Sheldon Peck was an artist and was deeply involved with the abolitionists in the Western suburbs of Chicago. Um, another interesting place, those of you that are near Maywood, uh, there is a McDonald's with an Underground Railroad Memorial. And you'll notice that this is the classic memorial with the tracks uh, appearing to go underground. This is at the site of the 10 Mile House. And uh, this was a stop on the Underground Railroad. There were uh, freedom seekers assisted there. And um, when th that burned down a long time ago, but when they were going to build a McDonald's, some of the people in Maywood said, this is an important site. Will you build an Underground Railroad memorial? And they've done that. So that's a kind of cool place to visit. And it has uh, 
uh, next to the tracks, it has uh, these symbolic uh, shackles. So if you're looking for an outing, find the McDonald's in Maywood and you'll find the Underground Railroad Memorial. Now, all of the folks, and we're talking over the, over the 30 years or so, we're talking about, you know, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 or more people that traveled up on these roads into Chicago or they came up along the INM Canal. And then from Chicago, they had to go directly south 15 miles. Remember, Chicago is what we think of as the loop. You know, in the 1830s, 1840s, that was Chicago. And so to go down what today is the southern edge of Chicago was actually 15 miles of open country to go down. They crossed the Little Calumet River. Those of you that know the area might know the Indiana Avenue Bridge crossing the Little Calumet. It's right next to where the Metro Electric crosses the CalSAG Channel. That was the site of the Chicago to Detroit Road and literally hundreds of people traveled by foot and uh, by, by coach and by wagon straight south out of Chicago to cross um, the Little Calumet River and head east toward Detroit. Now, in Chicago, a remarkable group of white families developed responses to the needs of freedom seekers. Uh, they were led by uh, uh, Charles and Elizabeth Dyer. Uh, you may know the name Alan Pinkerton, who becomes the great detective, was very involved with them. And what's striking is that in the early 1830s, as Chicago is this tiny community, a group of young white families begin to respond to the arrival of freedom seekers, and they become strong activists, strong abolitionists. And these are folks, all these families, they're in their late 20s, their early 30s. And they really develop and then maintain for two decades a commitment to be of service to people that are coming through. They also become the heart of the abolitionist movement uh, in Chicago. Interestingly, as a footnote for those of you that are interested in uh, the history of Judaism in Chicago, uh, in the 1850s, there were some very serious abolitionists uh, were involved in Lincoln's campaign. Uh, uh, two brothers, Michael and Henry Greenbaum, were very involved. We have evidence of one instance where um, uh, Greenbaum is, it appears that he was providing assistance for freedom seekers. And so the early Jewish community had an, an abolitionist orientation for the most part, but also there is intriguing evidence that some folks were actually uh, had some involvement with assisting freedom seekers. Now, part of what's really curious is that um, after 1844, there was always a very small black community in Chicago, but after 1844, a remarkable group of black leaders emerge and they really take over the running of the uh, Underground Railroad. And they work in close collaboration with all of these white radicals that have been providing help. Some of you may be familiar with the stories of John and Mary Richardson Jones. Um, uh, John Jones, the first man of color to be elected uh, to an um, office in Cook County in the 1870s. Uh, assisting them were uh, a number of families, Emma and Isaac Atkinson, uh, remarkable families, uh, Henry and Susan Wagoner, Barney and Julia Ford and others. Some of these folks were mixed race folks, but all of them identified themselves as part of Chicago's black community. And uh, what is really important to recognize is that traditional Chicago history sees um, good white abolitionists helping the black fugitives. And we need to understand that that history has to change. That in fact, after, the, after 1845, it was black leadership that was really providing the direction and the energy, the force and the resources to be assisting the freedom seekers coming through. And a lot of that energy was focused in two historic churches, Quinn Chapel, which started in the 1840s, and Zor Baptist Church started in the early 1850s, which becomes Olivet Baptist uh, on, uh, on King Drive, becomes one of the largest Protestant churches in the world uh, in, uh, in the 20th century. But, but the really powerful thing about Chicago is this 
a tremendous black and white biracial activity, and some would call this the first real civil rights movement in American history, with blacks and whites working together to help the freedom seekers coming through. And now remember, people getting to Chicago, the issue was to make tracks to Canada, either to go via the lakes or to go overland. And let me assure you, I've got dozens of stories about all of these, all of these things. But if, to turn back to the territory, remember that those folks that were in Chicago had to go due south. And consider, we have a couple, a couple examples of people that made it to Chicago and really were anxious to get freedom. And then to be told they had to go south for freedom was a little disconcerting. But essentially, they had to go south 15 miles to cross the Little Calumet River right here at the Indiana Avenue Bridge. And then to go on through the south suburbs uh, over into Northwest Indiana and then Northeast toward Detroit and to freedom in Canada. Now at that particular place that is here in this area, uh, Dutch settlers come and they establish what becomes Roseland kind of across from Lake Calumet and what becomes the community of South Holland which is down, which is down here. And key among those Dutch settlers were the families of Cornelius and Mary Kuiper and Jan and Anchi Tun. Uh, they were among the few Dutch settlers that spoke English. And they had come out of a situation of religious oppression and um, uh, were, were very interested in being supportive to and responding to the needs of freedom seekers. Uh, I've done a tremendous amount of research on these Dutch families and the Tun Farm, which was right on the Little Calumet River, which is now the Calsag Channel, was an established site where freedom seekers came, they were kept overnight and they were taken by wagons uh, onto, um, uh, onto uh, Indiana, Northwest Indiana, and then toward Canada. Uh, we've done a lot of research on the Tun Farm and their assistance the Dutch farmers provided. And today, the site of the Tun Farm is on a remarkable institution called the Chicago's Finest Marina. It is a the historically the oldest black owned marina in the Chicago region and is now owned by a group of retired Chicago policemen, hence the name, it's now become Chicago's Finest Marina. When we do tours, remember when we used to do tours before, before COVID, um, uh, one of the places we centered our tours on was having people here and, and my telling a series of stories about how freedom seekers were assisted right here on the edge of the Little Calumet River. And so again, to kind of focus on that, there's Lake Calumet, the Kuiper home was up here. The Detroit to Chicago road came straight down, came across and what is today Michigan City Road was of course, um, the road that went to Michigan City on the way to Detroit. That was the old Detroit to Chicago road. The Tun Farm was right on the river. Uh, there was Dutch settlement here in Roseland and then Dutch settlement down here in what becomes South Holland. And an interesting, interesting twist to this story about the Tun Farm. In 2011, I was approached by a young man named Tyrone Branch, who said he would love, as an Eagle Scout project, he would love to do a memorial to the Dutch farmers that helped freedom seekers. And so Tyrone, with his family, organized this remarkable group of a biracial group of white families and black families. They got together, they involved urban gardeners, a white gardening group and a black gardening group and other people. And they established this memorial to the Tun family. This is located on the property of the First Reformed Church uh, in South Holland, huge church, it's on South Park Avenue. And the church, which the Tun family and the Kuipers helped to establish in the 1850s, the church graciously gave uh, Tyrone the use of a small plot of land so we could establish this memorial garden. Uh, so that, you know, the stories are just endless. I could spend a whole hour talking just about the Tun Farm. Now the other, so we talked about a whole bunch of freedom seekers came up out of the center of Illinois, uh, up the, the I&M Canal and up overland to Chicago. 
another large contingent of folks came straight across. They came up the Illinois River Valley, uh, and then they went straight across LaSalle County, Will County, Southern Cook County on their way to uh, Detroit. And they were in the corridor of what's known as the Old Sauk Trail. And the Old Sauk Trail, hundreds of years old, was an, was an early, uh, heavily used Native American path from the Mississippi River to Detroit. And it was used by Native peoples traveling back and forth to Detroit to deal with the French and the English and then the Americans. And it was, as is shown in this picture, uh, across Illinois, it was a heavily used pathway and it was really, if you will, beaten into the ground. Uh, coming across uh, Will County uh, near um, uh, New Lenox was a, uh, a place called the Haven Tavern, which is well documented. There were other, um, there were other sites in Joliet and Homer Township and Mokina. And with each of these names, I've got you know, remarkable uh, sets of stories. Uh, Henry Belt was a, uh, a remarkable fellow, an African-American who was a, a leather worker and blacksmith who lived in Joliet. Uh, there were these other families in Homer Township uh, and Mokina and all of these people knew each other and all worked together to assist freedom seekers. Uh, so to give you, a, again, a kind of a sense of things in the, in the South region, remember that that Detroit to Chicago road came south out of Chicago was just way up north, came across the Little Calumet River, came into Northwest Indiana, and that is the old uh, Detroit uh, to Chicago road. Then the Salk Trail came across uh, Will County, then into the southern edge of Cook County. And there were a number of places in Park Forest and in uh, 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 South Chicago Heights where there were families that were assisting. Uh, most importantly in this whole bunch, there were a group of families, what is called Beebe's Grove, which is now part of Crete, but it's at the kind of the eastern edge of the village of Crete. And there a group of uh, um, farmers got together, they formed a congregational church, organized in 1839. In 1842, they issued one of the first statements in Illinois on church resolutions on opposing slavery very, very strong denunciation of, of uh, slavery coming out of this small congregation. They then worked with a number of freedom seekers coming across and uh, this uh, church built in 1853 and right in the middle of Crete uh, has now been designated along with the nearby cemetery. You can see the church in the background there. Uh, this church and the cemetery are now on the National Park Service Network to Freedom national listing of significant Underground Railroad sites. And of those 40 places that I've identified in the Chicago metro region, there are only four or five that are on this list. We've got a lot of work to do. Some of you wanna do some work, let me know. We've got a lot of work to do to get more of these sites uh, on, the, uh, um, on the list. Um, Hillary, my clock says 7.30, is that correct? Is that right? Okay, we're on time, thank you. Um, okay, so um, th this particular congregation in Crete will bounce back up in another, in another minute or two. So then in addition to the, uh, the work here in, um, um, along the Little Calumet River and the Dutch settlement people and the folks on the Salt Trail here in Park Forest and Richmond Park, there also are a number of specific sites that I've been able to identify across Northwestern Illinois. So if you want me to come back sometime and talk about Northwestern Illinois, I'll do that. But there's a whole bunch of stuff we've learned not only about the immediate Chicago area, but also about activity in North, uh, Northwestern Illinois, again, of people, for the most part, uh, white families, but there are a couple really fascinating examples of black individuals and families that were helping uh, freedom seekers to get on their way to, uh, to Canada. Uh, the whole range of stories, um, um, but remember that, that folks were traveling, coming up the Illinois River Valley, coming into Chicago or the Chicago region going on because the issue was, how do we get, how do we get to Detroit? Okay, now, uh, interestingly, 
by the time of the um, uh, the outbreak of the Civil War, there were a handful of um, of uh, African Americans living in uh, northwestern Indiana. There were probably by 1960 probably close to a thousand African Americans living in Chicago, and all of them were deeply involved in assisting freedom seekers. Now I have the lines on the map here because uh, freedom seeker stories are at essence journey stories. People that have found the courage and the opportunity and the good fortune to be able to escape from their situation and head toward, in our case, toward Chicago and then for Chicago going on to, um, on to freedom in Canada. And you can see that I've got four or five lines on this map. I could put a couple dozen lines. I have that many really great stories about people. The first really remarkable story I wanna share with you is that of Caroline Quarles. Uh, Caroline was uh, in 1843. She was 16 years old and living with, a, living with a family. She was a slave and of course they were free. She was the daughter of her master's son and a slave woman in the household. She grew up in this house with her cousins and she played with them and she was very close to them and they were all free human beings and she was enslaved. Finally, at age 16, she had had enough and she decided to go for her freedom. And so here you have this, this beautiful young woman, long black hair, blue eyes, freckles, very light skin, easily could pass as a white person, but she was enslaved. And at age 16, she had had enough and she decided that she was going to grab her freedom. Interestingly, Caroline came out of the Quarles family who were very proud of the Revolutionary War heritage. Her great grandfather, her white great grandfather and great grand uncle had served with George Washington in Valley Forge. They had in the early uh, uh, about 1815, they had moved from Virginia to St. Louis and there had acquired slaves and all that. But they were very proud of their revolutionary heritage. And here is this young woman who is enslaved because she is a black person, but she is of this white family. And she decided she was going to go for her freedom. And uh, remember how important that revolutionary fervor was. So Caroline goes down to the dock at St. Louis, passes as a white person, buys a ticket on a riverboat, and takes the riverboat uh, north to Galena in Illinois. And uh, uh, on the riverboat, she mixes with these other young white women, and, uh, and she just kind of passes. But the alarm is out in uh, St. Louis, and their slave catches are after. She gets to Galena. There's one white guy, one, I'm sorry, one black guy, uh, lives in uh, Galena, he sees Caroline on the street and said, you're passing. You're in real danger. You got to get out of here. Because he knew the slave catchers were on their way. So uh, they, this guy puts her on a, the first stage out of town, and she ends up going to Milwaukee. She was the first fugitive slave they'd seen in Wisconsin. And nobody knew what to do. There were people who were abolitionists, but they really couldn't figure out what to do. And there's a whole series of adventures in and around Milwaukee where they're trying to figure out what do we do with this beautiful young woman who's got to get to freedom in Canada. Finally, one of their one of their members decides he will be her escort. They borrow a buggy and he takes off and they leave uh, uh, the Milwaukee area and they come down around Chicago to avoid the slave catchers in Chicago. And they come down through Dundee and uh, Naperville and Lockport, uh, New Lenox, Beebe's Grove, which is um, um, a Crete. And remember that church that got started? She, Caroline stays with the people that had started that church in Crete and uh, has a wonderful encounter. This absolutely remarkable woman. She then goes on from there. They travel on to uh, Detroit, uh, get to freedom in Canada. In Canada, she um, uh, falls in love, marries a fellow who had escaped from Kentucky. They have six children and their descendants today live in um, uh, around Detroit on the Canada side and on the American side. And I've had the deep honor 
of getting to know some of her family very, very well and some absolutely remarkable people who are the direct descendants of Caroline Corals. One of them is a woman named Kimberly Simmons, who is Caroline's sixth generation granddaughter. And with Kimberly, I've uh, written a book, The Story of uh, uh, Caroline's, Caroline's Life. But can you imagine, 16 years old, 1843, she travels like 1,200 miles to get to freedom in Canada. Uh, just a remarkable, remarkable young woman. Can you imagine at 16 having that kind of courage? In 1841, John and Eliza Little uh, were on adjoining farms in Western Tennessee. They met, fell in love and got married. Realized that um, as enslaved people, they, uh, there was no future for them. If they were going to have a family, they might lose their children. So they resolved that they were going to escape. And so they got their satchels together. And in uh, uh, the spring of 1841, they headed up the Tennessee River to the Ohio River. And um, years later, John and Eliza were interviewed about this trek, this journey that they took. And John and Eliza, they were coming up the, um, uh, the Tennessee River to get to the Ohio River. And as they approached the Ohio River, they came into an area of a real swampland area. And, and John remembered years later, he remembered when we got to that swamp that he, that he put Eliza on a log. And he said, I put everything that I had, all that we owned were in two little satchels. And I put them behind Eliza on that log. And I pushed that log through the swamp. And I knew that if I made a mistake, everything that I loved would be lost. And he got through the swamp. And they got to the Ohio River and they, they borrowed a, um, a boat that was a small boat that was there, got across the Ohio River and came in exhaustion to the Illinois side of the river. They knew they were in Illinois and they weren't sure what to do. They ran in some other freedom seekers who were very discouraged and said, yeah, man, what are we going to do? Maybe we should, you know, turn ourselves in. We're close to Cairo. We could turn ourselves in. And Eliza Little said, I know where I have been and I know where I must go to be free. I will walk barefooted to Chicago if I have to. And John and Eliza Little did walk 370 miles up Illinois to, to reach Chicago. And then from Chicago, they walked that other 200 or so miles to get themselves to Canada. And they came south that 15 miles out of Chicago and crossed the Indian Avenue Bridge and walked on the Michigan City Road and they made their way to freedom in Canada. John Little was an absolutely remarkable man. All of his life, he was proud of his blackness. He was beaten. He carried shrapnel in his shoulder for his whole life because he was once shot. And John Little always said, I do not have a drop of white blood in me. I am a son of African princes. You know, what a, what a remarkable couple. They made their way to Canada and had a very successful farm there. The final story I wanna share, and then you might have some questions. The final story is about Henry Stevenson. This is a picture of Henry when he's about 95 years old. But in 1850, on the farm next to Henry, there was a couple named um, uh, uh, John and, uh, no, not John, William. William and Martha were an enslaved couple that had gone for their freedom. And this was in central Missouri. So they had gone to the, Ohio, the, the Mississippi River, up the Illinois on their way to freedom. Well, William and Martha's owner came to Henry Stevenson's owner and said, you've got to help me. The owner's name, by the way, was Uriah Hitch. Isn't that a great, good bad guy name? So Uriah Hitch came to the owner of Henry Stevenson and said, you have got to go with me and help uh, retrieve my slaves and bring Henry along because Henry's a really bright guy and he could help in the search. And remember that in, in very generalized terms, 
an average slave was worth 800 to a thousand dollars. In today's money, that's 15 to 20 thousand dollars. So for William and Martha to take off, you know, man, forty thousand dollars just walked off the farm. And so there was a real incentive to get that investment back. And so Uriah Hitch and Henry's owner and Henry took off. They went by horseback to St. Louis and every place they went through, they stopped, you know, they had brochures and Henry would talk to the, the black people and, uh, and they got to St. Louis and Henry went and talked to the black community and he came back, he said, listen, I found out they've been here, but, but William and Martha are on their way to Chicago. We got to go to Chicago to catch them. And so the two white guys were really thrilled with this news. They get on a packet boat to Alton. They go on, they take a river boat up the Illinois River and every town, significant town, they stop, they get out, they circulate their flyers, they go talk to the sheriff and all that. Henry goes and talks to the black people and he comes back and he says, well, these people ran into William and Martha. They came through here, we're on the right track, but they're headed for Chicago. So they get up to Peru and Ottawa and they get on the INM canal and they're on a canal boat. And again, every time they stop, they get off, circulate their flyers. Henry talks to any black people he can see. And he always comes back. William and Martha are on their way to Chicago. And as they're on the river boat, on the canal boat, um, there are these Irish workers along, working on the canal and they see Henry and they say, hey, hey fella, you're in Northern Illinois now. You're, you can be free. Just run away. You can be free here. And Henry would say, no, 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 no. I'm working for my master. We're looking for William and Martha. I got to get, get to Chicago to find William and Martha. And so finally, the, the two white guys and Henry arrive in Chicago. And of course, they're very proud of Henry because he's done such great research. So Henry says, all right, I'll go look. I'm sure I can find William and Martha. And he gets off the canal boat, he walks over and there's a bunch of people there waiting for the boats to come in. And there's a black guy up on a wagon and, uh, and he says, you need to ride into town. And Henry said, yes. Yeah. So he gets up, the black guy turns to Henry and says, well, what are you doing? And Henry says, well, I'm here looking for people. And the guy says to Henry, do you wanna be free? And Henry says, well, of course I wanna be free. And so the guy says, I can help you. So the guy takes Henry to the abolitionists probably the black abolitionists that were running things in Chicago. And they said, Henry, we can help you, but we're really low on money. And Henry says, money, I can get money. And so Henry goes back to the canal boat, to his master. And he says, I have found them. I found William and Martha. I know where they are, but I need some money to kind of, you know, pay some people off and stuff like that. And so the slave catchers give him some money and he gets back, goes back into Chicago, back to the abolitionists. And he says, I've got my money. I want my freedom. And so they put him on a, on a lake steamer and he heads for Detroit and freedom in Canada. And here is a picture of Henry when he's 95 years old, you know, decades later. And uh, he was delighted to tell people about the way he conned his way to freedom. Now, the uh, uh, Henry started, there's, there's Caroline's journey. And then there's Henry's journey starting in uh, uh, the center of Missouri and then going up the uh, Illinois River Valley, going on the canal and then taking a steamer over to uh, uh, New Bedford or um, um, New Buffalo and then taking the train in and going to freedom in Canada. Now, remember that freedom seeker stories are journey stories and that what we're talking about in this whole area is a remarkable group of human beings, individuals, families, small groups that broke free from their oppression. They seized their own freedom and they headed, a bunch of them headed in our direction. And we know loads of these stories. And part of what we need to do in terms of telling American history is to be telling these powerful stories of people seizing their own freedom being in charge of their own lives and of the remarkable group of people in Chicago, in the south suburbs of Chicago, in Northwest Indiana, blacks and whites working together that assisted these freedom seekers 
on their way to freedom. It's a remarkable set of stories and uh, I wanna share with you two of, the, two of the books I've got and would be delighted to talk about any questions. By the way, in terms of the, you know, I ident identified those 40 sites. Well, currently there are about 22, 23 sites in Illinois that are on that national list of Underground Railroad sites. That Creek Congregational Church that I talked about, the i &M Canal Headquarters building, the Tun Farm, and then those places in the Western suburbs. Um, so if you want more information, I'd be delighted. You can uh, order these two books at thorncreekpress.com. And um, I would be delighted to uh, um, see what questions you have. Hillary. Larry, thank you so much. That was really quite interesting. Really, really quite interesting. We've got quite a few questions already. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box and as time allows, we will get to them. Larry, if you wanna stop sharing your screen, that would be great. There we Thank go. You. Thank you so much. So Susan and Lynn both asked the same question. They want to know what prompted you to study and learn so much about the Underground Railroad. Um, it's a long story. The very short version is that when I was in college, I was involved in the civil rights movement, and I ended up spending a year studying at the University of Ghana in West Africa in 1964-65, and it became very clear to me that a good chunk of my life had to be devoted to figuring out this business of what it means to be white and what it means to be black in this country. And so I've been involved with racial justice issues for 60 years. And uh, the, my academic work just kind of flowed from that. And then as I indicated at the very beginning, when I started teaching in the South suburbs and was interacting with the black communities, I began running into the references of the Underground Railroad and realized this is something that nobody knows anything about. And uh, so, and hopefully when the, my final book is, um, um, I'm working with the University Press right now on the, my final big book. And when that is out, I think we will then be able to really change the history of all of this stuff and really talk about the, the power of uh, um, the Black community and these remarkable stories. Karen, it says, as far as freedom seekers leaving Missouri, to what extent were their journeys part of an organized effort to help enslaved people by abolitionists or others versus individuals who decided to flee on their own? Well, that's a, that's a great question. It really evolves over time, but the, the heart of it is that um, freedom seekers people enslaved make decisions to go for their freedom. And that over time, varieties of networks develop in response to, that, to those decisions. And, and for example, the great story, and you may be familiar with this, you know, one of the great stories of the Underground Railroad is the great raid where John Brown goes into Western Missouri, rescues these 12 people, takes them on a train across Iowa and, um, um, and Illinois. They come to Chicago. John Brown is helped by, by Alan Pinkerton and others, and they get the folks on a train to, to Detroit and freedom. Well, the story is always told backwards because in reality, what happened was there was a fellow named Jim, um, uh, Jim Daniels, Jim and um, Narcissa. Jim and Narcissa Daniels were enslaved in Western Missouri. Jim decides they have, their children are about to be sold. And so Jim decides they got to get free. And so Jim, it's a very complicated story, but Jim essentially ends up visiting in, um, um, in uh, Kansas runs into people who are friends of John Brown's, Jim Daniels asks for help. And then in response to Jim Daniels asking for help, John Brown comes in and then you have the whole story of this great transition of John Brown and his henchmen carrying these, guarding these 12 uh, um, uh, freedom seekers 
on their way to Chicago. But when they get to Chicago, they don't go to Alan Pinkerton. And again, all the stories say they went to Alan Pinkerton. They didn't. They went to John and Mary Jones, who were the head of the Black community in Chicago. And it was the Black community that helped John Brown and that helped these uh, people uh, for several days. Then they invited Pinkerton to provide assistance. And then Pinkerton gets involved in all that. But again, it's a, the, 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 the issue we have is that historically, we always want to talk about the Underground Railroad as this big structure that was helping people. No, freedom seekers went for their freedom. And as over time, networks of support developed. So they created the Underground Railroad, not the other way around. And that's really important to see. Um, Eddie is asking what roles, if any, did Chicago area Jews play in the Underground Railroad? Well, as I indicated, the, uh, my research suggests that there was, there was a small Jewish community uh, starting in the late, uh, in the 1840s, and uh, they became, uh, some of the leadership in that small community became very involved within the abolitionist movement and then in the development of the Republican Party. There were a couple people that were allies of Abraham Lincoln. And we have found in the records, and the research is in weird places. It's in family records, it's in newspapers, it's in old county histories. It's a very, very eclectic sources. But in those sources, I have uncovered one reference that indicates that one of the leaders in the 1850s, Henry Greenbaum, uh, was directly involved in at least one case of directly assisting a freedom seeker. So what we can say for sure about the small Jewish community is there was leadership that was very involved in the abolitionist movement, but most of those folks were not part of the Underground Railroad. There were only a handful of activists who were breaking the law in terms of the Underground Railroad. And we think that a couple of those uh, <clears throat> early Jewish uh, activists may have been involved with the Underground Railroad. And there's always more evidence to find. If somebody out there knows things, please tell me. Every month I learn something new. By the way, let me, one thing I, I did not talk about, but just to point to, remember that in 1850, the federal government institutes nationally the Fugitive Slave Law, and that dramatically uh, changed the situation, made everything much more serious. And I forgot to mention that. Just a reminder that all the questions should come in the chat box. We're, we're not unmuting anyone. Um, Barbara asks, what were the repercussions for those who helped the freedom seekers, especially those who were of mixed race and those who were prominent whites? The <clears throat> Uh, I just mentioned the, the power of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law that really developed a degree of seriousness for everybody that was assisting freedom seekers, whether they were black or mixed race or white. Uh, the federal law said that you could be fined $1,000 for helping somebody, roughly the equivalent of $20,000 today. And uh, it was mandated that if you, anywhere you lived in the country, if you um, were called upon by civil authorities to help apprehend fugitive slaves, you had to do that. And if you didn't, you could be fined. You could be thrown in jail yourself. Um, it was a very, very rigorous law. Um, and so from 1850 on for everybody, the consequences were, you know, could be very severe. Now by, the mid 1850s, the Underground Railroad is really an open secret in Chicago. And kind of everybody knows that there are people doing that. And the abolition opinion is strong enough that nobody's really going to get arrested. But the danger is there. And uh, there are some really powerful stories about where people got on the wrong side of the law. But uh, in terms of the illegalities, um, um, of helping fugitives, uh, whether you were, were black or white, 
you know, you were in serious trouble. Now, remember that the, the part of the complication for this was that for Black families living in Chicago, you always had the danger of kidnapping. There were organized kidnapping groups in St. Louis and in Southern Illinois. And they would from time to time make their way to Chicago and steal people off the street, take them south and sell them into slavery. So uh, the consequences for everybody in this, although abolition by the mid 1850s, abolition is very strong. The laws are still strong and it's all very serious. I hope that gets at the question. Um, Karen is asking, in your opinion, what percentage of the safe houses or railroad stops were operated by African Americans? Um, in the, the, the again, it's a it's a matter of 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 the timing. Um, prior to 1845. Most of the activity and outside the city of Chicago, almost all of the activity involved white farm families. Uh, there was a very tiny black community uh, in the 1830s, early 1840s, and it appears that they were actively involved in assisting freedom seekers, but the major activity in Chicago was in the hands of those young white abolitionist activist families. Um, and so all of the sites would be there, you know, kind of white sites. Uh, after 1845, and with this, the emergence of this very strong black leadership, uh, th there were there were then a whole series of sites, including Quinn Chapel and Zor Baptist Church, and the homes of people like the Wagoners and the Fords and the Joneses and the Atkinsons and a number of others. So there were probably just a generalized, let me say, maybe if we really dug and did it, when we finished all of our research, we could say, maybe there were a dozen or so African-American homes that were regular stops and a dozen or so white homes that were regular stops. But the activity was led by the Black, by the Black community. Maureen. By the way, I've identified, excuse me, I have identified in Chicago itself 14 places that ought to be uh, nationally recognized for the Underground Railroad, 14 sites where I can, and uh, five of those are African American based. Maureen is asking, when were the slaves in the four border states that stayed in the Union freed? Ah, with at, after the conclusion of the Civil War, with the passage of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, then everybody's free and on board. In the, in the uh, secessionist states, the Emancipation Proclamation is January uh, 1st, 1863. So it, you know, the war, war drags on for another year and a half. And so that's when all of the slaves get free. And remember, of course, that although Texas was part of the Confederacy, the slaves in Texas didn't learn of their freedom until after, well after the Civil War. And the reason is June 19th, 1865. It's like a, you know, a year plus after the end of the war that these slaves finally get the word. And, you know, remember communications was a different world than well, how we do things today. No texting, right? Yeah, no texting, no <laughs> phones, no, uh, no Fox News. Jane is asking, the Homestead Act came later in 1860, but she's wondering if Black people were able to apply for the 160, I believe she means acres of land. Um, yeah, now that you, you're getting outside my, my area of, of, of complete knowledge, but I am aware, for example, in... Kansas and in Oklahoma, there were a number of, and in fact, there were several places in the South where Black families banded together and went together to Kansas and to Oklahoma to, to, to claim land uh, through the Homestead Act. Uh, the most famous of these is really famous town called Nicodemus, 
and I'm almost sure Nicodemus is in Kansas. Uh, so there were some very interesting efforts uh, by, by Black families to take advantage of the Homestead Act, basically after the Civil War. Uh, Ron says, you touched briefly on some Jewish involvement in the Underground Railroad, but was that all? Was there any other um, instances where Jews were involved in helping the slaves? It's possible, but that's all I've uncovered to date. The, you know, I've, I've been through all kinds of records and, uh, uh, and that, I mean, it's the kind of stuff I was looking for and that's all I've found so far. But again, please remember that this is a, because it was all illegal, sometimes the records are elusive. So if you should ever hear of other things, please get in touch with, with Hillary and say, how do we get in touch with that McClellan guy? Because I've got some information. I would be delighted to hear from you. But what we have so far, and what I shared with you, it's, you know, in, in my, the stuff I've written, and that's going to be published next year, it says a little bit more, but not much more. I mean, I, we don't know very much. But again, remember that it was a, uh, it was a, the Jewish community was pretty small in the 1850s and 60s. I mean, 1840s and 50s. Uh, Jane has another question. Why were the, the slaves or the people who were escaping not taken up uh, the lake by boat? Well, remember, I pointed to that in people coming to Chicago, roughly of the people coming to Chicago, uh, roughly half went by lake steamer to Detroit. So they did travel. And we've got a whole cycle of, you know, I could give me another 30 minutes and I could tell you a whole set of sea stories about the lake travel. There are some great, great stories, but roughly half the people came to Chicago went by lake and the other half uh, uh, went overland down through along the Detroit to Chicago road. One really quick story. Uh, one guy, um, uh, Captain, uh, Captain Walker on the steamship Illinois, and he was regularly uh, transporting freedom seekers in the in the guts of his ship, of his uh, lake steamer. And um, one time they found out about, some people started, a rumor started that there were fugitives stowed away. And Walker on it, Captain Walker happened to be carrying a bunch of Southern aristocrats who were touring on the lakes and they were up top. And so what they decided to do was that when they got around the top of Lake Michigan, and they got to the other side, they were coming down on Lake Huron, and at dinner one night, Captain Walker arranges for his crew to come and report to him. And they rush into the dining room and say, Captain, we've just discovered that there are fugitive slaves stowawaying on the ship. And the captain gets up dramatically and said, we're not going to have that on my ship. I'm going to kick them off the first port we get to. And of course, all the Southerners are delighted. And so he immediately steers the lake steamer toward Canada, stops on the shore, and literally kicks these fugitives to their freedom in Canada. So we got a lot of stories like that. I think that was our last question. This was this is fascinating. I grew up on the East Coast, so we there was a lot of action on the um, Underground Railroad, uh, you know, New York. And, and down the East Coast. So it's it's always interesting to hear about my adopted state and, and what went on to help, you know, people really get to live their lives in a way that they were intended to. Thank you everyone for joining us. This was our last um, virtual program for our JCC Chicago fiscal year. So um, I'm excited that we ended on such a great note. Please visit our website, jccchicago.org. For those of you who live in the Chicago area, we are going to start some new um, programs that will be in person and outdoors. So those are on our website, again, jccchicago.org. 
on uh, July 8th, we're having a visit from a um, Abraham Lincoln impersonator. So that should be really, really great. Again, you can find that on our website. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Larry, we really appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your week and a safe July 4th. Bye-bye everybody. Bye-bye.